Now, here is an argument which you will not hear that frequently, but it is used occasionally. It's 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. But even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Now, the argument goes like this. I went to a um, reformed church, and here in the UK, unfortunately, there are some reformed churches. There are a few good reformed churches, I'm sure, but there are also a lot of bad reformed churches where you have an uneducated man with no theological training, usually nasty, aggressive and vicious. Um, these little reformed churches are basically one-man bands then, run by uneducated men. And they are very, very strong indeed on tithing, on not drinking alcohol, and on obeying the eldership of the church, not questioning anything. The sad thing, as I said, is the eldership are often uneducated and um, you can't dialogue with a lot of these people because they're, they're um, usually quite old and they're stuck in their ways and um, they're some of the most arrogant, conceited people you will ever meet in your life. And um, in some of these little reformed churches that I've been to, particularly one in Exeter, you will find some of the cruelest people you'll ever meet in, in your entire life. Um, people who are dominated by hatred of anyone who refuses to convert to their little reformed churches. Anyway, the argument goes like this. If you don't tithe to our church, and if you happen to be either ill, or you're sick, or you're unemployed, then the Bible says this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 So, you don't have a job, you're unemployed, or you're sick then the Bible says you should starve to death, or at least that's the question that I put to this man, Mr. Clark, here in Plymouth. He said, if you don't work, you shall not eat. So I then said, well, actually, I do work. I'm unemployed, but I, I, I volunteer my services two days a week in a um, school where I teach IT skills, and then later on I moved to a language school where I taught English. But I wasn't paid. It was a voluntary job where I was working unpaid while I was, un while I was unemployed. Now, his attitude was, it doesn't matter. If you don't work and you're not in a paid job, you should not eat. So I then said, are you saying that unemployed people should starve to death? Now, he didn't like the question. He also didn't like me challenging on him on tithing. Oh, and the other thing he was very, very strict on was alcohol. If you're a Christian, you must not drink alcohol. He was very strict on that, but he unfortunately couldn't prove it from the scriptures. And he just became angry when I asked him various questions about that. But it's a good thing to say. Are you saying that a Christian pastor like yourself can sit at his big table with lots of good food on it, rather like um, the rich man in the La Lazarus and the rich man story, and you can eat all your fine food, and you can be nice and fat and plump as this man was. Mind you, I'm a bit plump myself although I have lost weight recently, and you can see a poor unemployed person outside your door starving to death, and you must let that unemployed person starve to death, because the Bible says, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Now, he didn't like me asking that question. Also, what about people who are sick? What about a builder on a building site who gets injured? Maybe something falls on him, a girder falls on him, and he goes into intensive care in hospital. Well, he's not working now, is he? He's, he's been injured. So the Bible says, if you will not work, neither shall he eat. So should we let all people in hospital starve to death? And should we say, we are Christians? And the Bible teaches in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if a person will not work, because they shall not eat. So we let the um, unemployed starve to death. We let people in hospital starve to death. What about people who have mental illnesses, who are in mental hospitals? They're not working, so should we let them starve to death? What about, what about babies and toddlers? Babies and toddlers can't work, can they? So we should let babies starve to death if we're Christians. Is that what you're saying, Mr. Clark? And of course, Mr. Clark, he's called Mr. because he has no theological training, no education. He's not ordained by anyone. He's a self-appointed guy. Um, he just became very, very angry. So that's how I dealt with this verse. But the context for this verse is apostasy. In Thess 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul's, Paul deals with the great apostasy that's coming. From uh, chapter 2, verse 13 to 17, he tells people to stand fast in the faith. Okay, Don't fall for the strong del delusion that's coming. Stand fast in the truth that you've been taught. Okay, um, In chapter 3, he urges people to pray for him and his companions. 
And then in verse 6, chapter 3, verse 6, there is a warning against idleness. Now, that's the context for verse 10. Okay? It's a warning against idleness. Now, in the early church, what you need to know is that um, you didn't have pastors in the early church. You had elders. And in almost every case, elders were unpaid. The only instance where a person would receive money from the church would be if that person was in a missionary situation preaching the gospel as a missionary uh, somewhere where the gospel hadn't been preached before or had been preached without success. What happened was if you were a preacher in a church in the first century, you did not get a five bedroom house paid for by the church. You did not get a golden chariot and team of horses that you can whip through the streets uh, paid for by the church. You didn't get slaves or servants to pamper to your every need, cleaning your house, preparing your food. You didn't receive free sandals and free togas from the best shop in town paid for by the church. That's the impression that many pastors will try and give you today, including, I might add, unfortunately, not just the Pentecostal and the Charismatic pastors and Seventh-day Adventist pastors, but even reform pastors here in the UK. They are so given over to money and so given over to the love of, of an easy life that these pastors can lead that they will try and convince you that um, if a person has a title of pastor, then that person needs to have all the money being raised in the church flowing to that pastor and to his family. And it wasn't like that in the first century at all. In the first century, in Acts 2.44, it says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. See, what the church did was they raised uh, food or money, and every day, they didn't have ref refrigeration, of course, in those days, what they would do is they would give food to the widows and the orphans or the sick and infirm in the church who couldn't work. And that was a good thing to do. That was a thing that was right and proper to do. Now, what about a person who was an elder who was a teaching elder? You see, that, as I said, they didn't have pastors in those days. Pastors, pastor was not an office. Pastor in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, is a gift. Look at verse 8. God gave gifts to men. OK, um, it's a gift. It's not an office to be filled. So in Acts chapter six, verse one, we read now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a murmuring against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. The daily distribution refers to this distribution of food by which all the widows and all the orphans in the church who couldn't care for themselves were cared for by the church community because remember the church they had all things in common this is also referred to in second corinthians chapter 9 verse 1 now concerning the ministering to the saints notice saints is a plural it is superfluous for me to write to you so again this is talking about ministering to the saints now if you taught in the church and you taught well you were an elder who preached the word well you didn't just receive double honour, and double honour means double honour, it doesn't mean double money, okay? You also had the right to the best food in this daily uh, distribution. So if they had a nice lamb joint and some beef that was a little bit old but reasonably good and then lots of vegetables, then the elder who preached the word well would receive the lamb. People who worked in the church, like deacons or people who cleaned the church, you know, if they had their own separate, well, they usually didn't have separate church buildings in the first century, they'd meet in people's homes. But people who would do deacons jobs, functions, functions like that, or maybe people who would be musicians, who, who would work in the church in that aspect, they would receive the food that was not so good. And the people at the back of the queue would be the elderly, the widows and the orphans. So that's the context, you see, for Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 3.10. In verse 8, Paul says, Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labour and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. So Paul's point is this, he had a right to the best of the food from the daily distribution, but he chose not to take it. He wanted to be an example 
to this church. And so he would rather work, he was a tent maker, he worked at tent making, he'd rather do that and be a good example just as I, when I was unemployed, I worked, as I say, I, I worked teaching IT and then I worked teaching uh, English in a language school even though those jobs were unpaid. I chose to do that. And Paul's point is this, he could have received food from the daily distribution but he chose not to because he wanted to be a good example and perhaps there wasn't very much to go around perhaps Paul wanted some of the better food to go to those poor widows and orphans who might not be able to receive much meat maybe they were just receiving vegetables Paul's point is this he's against idleness he's against people in this daily distribution sponging off the system so when Paul says if anyone will not work neither shall he eat Paul isn't saying that if somebody is working as a building labourer and they get hit by something and they go to a hospital, okay, that person should starve to death because if you don't work, you shan't eat. That's not Paul's point. Paul's point is if you don't work within the church, apart, of course, from the widows and orphans who can't care for themselves, but if you're a young man and you're capable of work and you choose not to work, then you should not receive anything for the daily distribution. That's Paul's point. And unfortunately... Um, it was very difficult to try and get through to this reformed pastor because he didn't really have the capacity to dialogue about the scriptures. He was a preacher who would tell you that you must not question him. And um, it's very, very sad. And the two extremes that we have to avoid in the Christian church are basically this. The first is would be people like a neighbour of mine in London. Uh, I had a neighbour in London when I li lived in London in the 1980s called Michael or Mick. He was from Ireland and he ha used to have these young cousins who would visit him. And I was very naive at the time. I was a lot younger than I am now. I was, I was in my 20s. And all of these young cousins were young boys uh, with blonde hair, usually about 12, 13, 14, 15, that sort of age. And I didn't really think much of it. I thought they were his cousins or nephews or whatever he said. I think it was nephews or cousins. And then one day there was a policeman outside his door and one of these cousins had bashed him over the head with a hammer during sex because he was a paedophile, he was molesting these boys. Uh, and the incredible thing was that the Catholic Church had paid for everything in his flat, everything, the carpet, the bed, everything was provided free by these do-gooders. They'd even bring food to him, oh we've got the food for you. And um, he was sponging off the system and that's that's one extreme that's that's wrong the other extreme would be what what we see in a lot of churches today where you have in many cases pastors leaders who are uneducated men many of them are spineless cowards many of them lack a decent proper theological education they're ignorant and yet these people received the free house, the free car, the pension, um, the medical insurance and dental insurance for them and their family. Sometimes school kids, private school fees paid for their children. Many pastors are on a gravy train of expenses and perks. And that's the other extreme that we need to avoid. In the early church, Acts 2.44, they had all things in common. They didn't give everything to one man called a pastor, as happens today. And um, frankly, I, I find a lot of evangelical Christianity here in the UK utterly disgraceful and utterly demonic. And I personally have nothing to do with it whatsoever. I don't go to church. I don't want to be associated with the church. I find most of it evil and demonic to the core. Thank you.